So it's a, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, and uh, I think back to another time 24 years ago when I stood at this uh, lectern and gave the, the summary lecture for the 1990 meeting on the brain. And the difference between thinking about that meeting and this meeting, two things really stand out. One is that meeting was mostly about the parts of the brain, uh, the molecules, the signaling mechanisms, the, the, uh, the, the material in the brain that made things work. And um, there was a little bit at the end called cognitive neuroscience, but it wasn't, it was more neuroscience and less cognition. And, and really, cognition was not really the domain of biology at that point. It was, there were psychologists giving, uh, you know, interesting talks about it. Uh, and now we have the ambition to address cognition. The second enormous change is that at this meeting, unlike at that, many of the talks, a great many of the talks, and probably the, the majority of the best talks, are being given by women. And there were hardly any women giving the talks at the symposium in 1990. So things really have changed in neuroscience. So what I want to talk about is um, our features of brain state in alert animals. And in some ways, this is a mammalian parallel very much to the things that Bill and, and Corey and Sean talked about in the first half of this session. Now, for most of neuro, the history of neuroscience, studies of brain state have, have really, you know, there were, there were two states. There was awake and asleep, and sleep was divided into a number of states. But now that it's possible to study alert animals, we're learning something about brain state in alert animals. And a lot of this came from an experiment that Chris Neal and I um, did, uh, not trying to investigate brain state so much, but just trying to see whether the properties of neurons in alert animals were the same as what we'd seen in anesthetized animals, using this apparatus that David Tank had built, where a mouse can walk or stand or do anything he wants on top of a um, large styrofoam ball floating in air. And what we saw was considerable variability in the responses, but when we coded the responses according to whether the animal happened to be walking or happened to be stationary during the time that the responses were elicited by this stimulus here, what we saw was that the um, responses when the animal was, was running or walking were much greater than when the animal was stationary. But the selectivity of the neuron was unimpaired. And that was true both with single unit recording and with optical recording. You see the same difference that when the neurons were, um, uh, when the neurons were not seeing an optimal stimulus, their spontaneous activity was unchanged, but their response to an optimal stimulus was much greater. So that's why we described it as a change in gain. And there was no similar change in the lateral geniculate nucleus, which said that it wasn't vibration of the eyes or anything like that that was responsible for this, but it was some cortical-specific phenomenon that cranks up the magnitude of responses in cortex. And without any change in spontaneous activity among the cells in the upper layers of visual cortex. A big change in the evoked activity, but no change in selectivity or in the width of tuning. So this seemed to be a particularly interesting high-gain state of the visual cortex that we could, in, we could control in mice with locomotion. And it led us to think about a number of plasticity experiments in which many things, like enriched environments, antidepressants, amphetamines, lots of manipulations are reported to increase plasticity in the brain. And so we decided to see whether putting the animal in this high gain state would increase plasticity in the mouse brain. And we studied this using a mouse model of recovery from amblyopia. So we deprived an animal 
from the critical period through about five months of vision in its contralateral eye. And then we opened the contralateral eye and measured the response at weekly intervals. And this shows a bunch of different mice. And they never get more than about halfway to the normal range of responsiveness, in common with what you see in human amblyopes who um, lose a vision in the good eye and need to rely on our amblyopic eye in adulthood. Uh, then we did the experiment of letting the animals uh, walk or run as they pleased on this styrofoam ball while they were seeing a high contrast visual pattern for four hours a day. And the controls were leaving the animal in their home cage, which is the data I showed in the last slide, or allowing them to have locomotion looking at a gray screen or allowing them to have visual stimulation without the opportunity for locomotion by giving the visual stimulation in their home cage. And the effects of locomotion on plasticity were really dramatic. Animals recovered to near the normal range in a week and fully got fully within the normal range uh, thereafter. And none of the controls were much different from leaving the animals in their home cage. So it was the simultaneous uh, experience of a particular pattern of visual stimulation with this high gain state of the cortex produced by locomotion that seemed to be responsible for this remarkable plasticity. Now fortunately, we, we used two different stimuli in these studies. One was a high contrast, uh, a, a, a periodically modulated con contrast stimulus of spatiotemporal noise matched to the spatiotemporal bandwidth of normal adult mice. The other was a traditional visual system stimulus of gradings of different spatial frequencies and different orientations moving across the visual field. Now, some mice saw one stimulus while they were um, uh, allowed to do locomotion. Some mice saw the other stimulus. We tested the animals with both stimuli and we did this because just to get twice as much data, basically, the two stimuli give very similar responses of very similar magnitudes in normal mice. But strikingly, in these animals, if we tested the animals with bars, oriented bars, then the animals that had seen the gratings with oriented bars in them during locomotion recovered beautifully, whereas the animals that had, had the experience with the noise pattern did not recover. On the other hand, when we tested the animal with the spatiotemporally band limited noise, the animals that had had experience with the bars didn't recover. They were just the same as the animals uh, that didn't get any experience, whereas the animals that had an experience with the noise pattern did recover. So this showed that it's a stimulus specific recovery. The particular cells that were um, the particular stimulus that was driving the cells during the high gain state produced by locomotion uh, were the ones that, uh, that was, were the uh, responses that recovered. Now it was hard to imagine how this recovery would happen because many years ago Antonella and Antonini and I had shown that you lose much of the excitatory input from the genicular cortical afferents going to the cortex, and it doesn't get restored in a few weeks of this kind of experience. So it was of interest to look at the excitatory cells and the inhibitory cells, which correspond more or less to the broad spiking and the narrow spiking cells. And what we saw is that in a stimulus-specific manner, looking at a, you know, several 500 to 1,000 cells of each type, the responses of the broad spiking cells recover essentially completely. Uh, depending on which stimulus we use, they recover their response to one stimulus or to the other. How can they do this if they're deprived of so much of their excitatory input? Well, the way that this seems to happen is that the, in, the activity of the inhibitory cells is very much reduced even after recovery. So it seems to be that the excitatory cells get back their normal level of activity, at least in large part, by reducing the activity of the inhibitory cells. And this is also reflected in the spontaneous activity, which is uh, 
normally very low in the excitatory cells, but uh, in the absence of proper inhibitory regulation after recovery, it's, it's much, much higher. So we're interested in what are the pathways that turn the cortex on into this high gain state. And so we started with the pathways that are responsible for locomotion. And Moses Lee and Chris Neal and I looked at uh, the mice starting from the midbrain locomotory center around the pedunculopontine tegmental nucleus that Orlovsky and a bunch of Russian researchers had shown in the 1960s what would produce locomotion when it was stimulated electrically. Now, of course, with electrical stimulation, you really have no idea which cells you're exciting, but now we can use optogenetic activation of the glutamatergic cells, uh, the, the um, excitatory glutamatergic cells in the pedunculopontine tegmental nucleus, and when we activate them optogenetically, we can make the cells fire. And when that happens, we make the animal walk. Look at the blue light. And as soon as the blue light comes on, the mouse starts to run. And as soon as the blue light goes off, he stops, comes on again in a second, starts to run again, and so on. Now, this was dramatic. It increased responses in the cortex very dramatically. And was completely uninformative because even if you don't stimulate optogenetically, when the animal starts to run, the responses in the cortex go into their high gain state. What was interesting, though, was when we turned down the frequency of the stimulation, we could turn it down to a level at which the, which, at which the animal no longer started running. But even when the stimulus was turned down to that level, we still uh, enhance the responses in the visual cortex. So we could mimic the effects of locomotion on the cortex by stimulating in the midbrain locomotory center below the threshold for eliciting locomotion. And you can sort of see it here. This is uh, an animal without any optogenetic stimulation comparing the firing rate of a bunch of neurons uh, with, when the animal was stationary to when the animal was walking or running. Uh, this is, a, in this graph, are data from uh, times only when the animal was just standing there. It was stationary, but comparing it without the laser and with the laser. So we can mimic the effect of locomotion very well by uh, stimulating in this area. So our conclusion is that it's not the descending connections from the midbrain locomotory center that make the legs move that turns on the cortex but it's one or more of these ascending connections which go to the basal forebrain, the striatum, and a bunch of other places. And we can partially mimic the effect of locomotion, but not completely, by stimulating the terminals of the uh, cells whose, uh, that express channel rhodopsin in the uh, pedunculopontine tegmental nucleus that project to the basal forebrain, we can stimulate the, their terminals and partially but not completely mimic the effect of locomotion. So there's, there's more to do about that. But you can also ask, and we did, what's the cortical part of the pathway for enhancing V1 activity by locomotion? And now with the uh, availability of crelines that can allow you to uh, identify and perturb the responses of specific classes of cells, uh, Yufu in the laboratory um, looked systematically at a number of different kinds of cells to find cells that would carry the signal of locomotion to the cortex in the dark. In the dark because most cells in the visual cortex aren't doing anything in the dark, so any cell that responded in association with locomotion in the dark was a good candidate for being part of this cortical activation system. And finally, we tried these VIP cells, which is a minor class of inhibitory neurons expressing vasoactive intestinal peptide. Uh, not that they have anything to do with the guts. They're, they're in the brain. And we could record the activity of VIP cells and non-VIP cells using Oregon Green BAPTA, um, 
we could see them in the two-photon microscopy, and then we could record the calcium signals in them and know what they were uh, responding to. And this shows a trace of running speed as a function of time over 400 seconds, and this is a typical response from a VIP neuron, and all of the upper layer VIP neurons that we studied responded this way, that when the animal was running or walking, they, uh, they were showed uh, calcium signals indicating neural activity. When the animal stopped, their calcium signals went away. So they were uh, faithful, uh, faithfully reproduced the signal of locomotion that activates cortical cells. 97% of the non-VIP neurons did not, so, did not show such signals. So you can ask, how can activity in an inhibitory neuron enhance activity in the cortical circuit? After all, these are inhibitory neurons. And the insight about that came from a paper by Massimo Sconziani and his co-workers and, and other cons work consistent with us in the field that the major output of VIP neurons is somatostatin neurons. And somatostatin neurons, one of their major outputs is to inhibit the excitatory cells in the cortex. So the hypothesis would be that when locomotion comes, VIP cells are active, they inhibit somatostatin cells, which makes them fire less or silences them, and that relieves the excitatory cells of inhibition, and that's a perfect me uh, method for enhancing gain. It doesn't interfere with any of the sensory signals to the excitatory cells. It just lets them express their response to those sensory signals better. And so one of the predictions of that hypothesis is that if we record from a somatostatin cell, what we would see is that it would be less active during locomotion. And indeed, that's what we saw in all the, the upper layer somatostatin cells that we recorded. The other prediction would be that the parvalbumin cells would be heterogeneous and transient. And, and indeed, that's what we found. Some of them responded to locomotion positively, some negatively, uh, almost all of them transiently. The next question we asked is, where do these VIP cells get their input? And we, of course, we thought it would be motor cortex, right? Wrong. Uh, there was hardly anything using the Callaway technique with a modified rabies virus to look for monosynaptic inputs to the upper layer VIP cells, the ones who, that, whose responses we'd studied. The most interesting source of input to us was the nucleus of the diagonal band of Broca, which is a cholinergic nucleus in the basal forebrain in an area that receives projections from the midbrain locomotory region. Uh, here's a higher uh, uh, resolution view of that. And since it's a cholinergic nucleus, we wonder naturally, are the VIP neurons responding to uh, cholinergic signals? Because there's been a vast literature on cholinergic effects on cortical state, mostly in anesthetized animals, but also a little bit in alert animals. And indeed, in vitro, when you look at the responses of VIP neurons to acetylcholine, they're, they are very powerfully activated by acetylcholine through nicotinic cholinergic receptors. So if you block the nicotinic receptors, you block the response in vitro of these VIP neurons. So to test whether this was going on in our experiments, we recorded from VIP neurons and from the neighboring excitatory cells in the mice that were allowed to stand still or walk on the, on the ball. And when we infused uh, nicotinic blockers underneath of them through a pipette, uh, we blocked about 70% of the response to um, locomotion. So it seemed like cholinergic activation was a very powerful uh, component of uh, turning on the VIP cells and turning on the response of, of the high gain state of cortex. So finally, we were interested in the issue of is, it, is all you need the VIP cells to put this uh, cortex in the high gain state? And so what we did was to transfect the VIP cells with channel rhodopsin. Uh, this is the response without the laser activating the channel rhodopsin. This is the response 
uh, I mean, this is the response without uh, activating the VIP cells with channel redox, and this is the response if we do that, and indeed, uh, activating the VIP cells turned on the high gain state in the cortex. So the final experiment was to see, are the VIP cells necessary for the effect of locomotion? And we were unable to use optogenetic means to transiently and reversibly silence the VIP cells because their cholinergic activation by locomotion is so powerful we just couldn't overcome it. So what we did instead was to measure the response in, in uh, a bunch of experiments to measure the enhanced activity to locomotion and then blow away the VIP cells, put our, focus our laser on them one by one uh, in the microscope field and then blow them away uh, and then measure the response to locomotion afterwards. And we completely blocked the enhancement of visual responses to locomotion. So the anatomical elements of the VIP cell circuit for enhancing gain that we see in V1 are really present in all the cortical, neocortical areas I know of. Cholinergic effects on brain plasticity are also widely reported although the cortical portions of the neural circuits that are responsible for this haven't been identified. We think it's likely that the same circuit that's activated by locomotion in the mouse may account for a lot of phenomena of gain enhancement, like what is seen in primates with focal attention. Uh, but we don't yet know how this system activates with the layer six based mechanism for, for gain modulation which was identified many years ago in experiments that Jurgen Boltz and Charlie Gilbert did, and uh, much more is known about it now. So finally, I want to end uh, with uh, showing you the people who did this work. Megumi Kaniko did the work on plasticity in the plasticity experiment. Uh, Chris Neal and Moses Lee uh, did the work on the subcortical portion of the circuit that uh, is responsible for activating the cortex with locomotion, and Yu Fu did the work on the VIP cells. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, Sean. I'm curious, um, how many VIP cells did you have to ablate, and what's the relationship between the size of the effect and the number of cells you ablated? It sounds like it was hard. We did not investigate that relationship systematically. We ablated all the ones we could see in the field, which was between about 12 and about 45. Uh, and we only measured the response in that one field. So I think it's a really interesting question. And having done that experiment, um, we, we, have, we have other ways in which we think we can silence the output of the VIP cells, and it'll be a very interesting question to see how local is the effect of a single VIP cell. And we really have nothing to say about it, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I've been really struck by this work since the original Neil and Stryker paper came out. And one reason is because it seems to bear quite a lot on the notion of modularity in cortex, and although I realize that notion is a very fluid one, I'd be interested to hear how you think it is relevant to the general assumptions about the modular organization of cortex. Well, this may be silly, but what I sort of think that is going on is that if you're in a state where you're moving through the environment where long distance extraceptive information is more relevant to your survival, it's a good strategy to have the area of the brain that's giving you that information shout a whole lot louder to the rest of the brain. And so, um, so that's what I think. And that's consistent with, uh, you know, a, a few months, a month, or I guess just a month after Chris Neal and I published the original finding, uh, Mike Dickinson showed that in flies, as soon as they start to fly, the gain of their visual system goes up by a similar amount. And this is not a common circuit. I think this is a common theme in evolution that turning on the visual system to a higher gain state 
is really useful when you're moving through the environment. Uh, the modularity issue, I, we don't know how activity in other areas are affected by what we see, but I, but I think if you're going to read the map in visual cortex, it's better to have it louder under circumstances in which you'd like to be listening to it. So, uh, Mike, <clears throat> what are the implications uh, for you know, the, the beautiful work you've done for things like rehab therapy and for uh, enhancing normal learning? I hope I'll be able to say a lot more about that in another year. So, um, with one of my colleagues at UCSF, we're uh, trying to see whether in humans, there are electrophysiological signs that the same thing is going on with locomotion. I think it's entirely possible that it is, but it's also entirely possible that it's not. The same circuit is there, but it may be hooked into a lot of different inputs for different areas depending, you know, on the species and on the area. Uh, and so it's a, it's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I haven't... Um, I, I hope it will turn out to be therapeutically useful, but time will tell. So, Mike, uh, fascinating work. Here, here, here. Dora, <laughs> there you are. So, um, I, I have two questions. One is more global. Uh, so, I think, is, am I correct to interpret um, what you have shown as, the, as a, uh, related to perhaps active sensing? And whether, I know you didn't, the mouse does not move the eyes much, I don't know how much they move the mm. eyes, but they, they could, I mean, locomotion for me can be like for us equivalent to moving our head, moving our eyes, exploring the world in a way that is meaningful. So this is the first question. The second question is how, how can you... Um, I'm going to so, yeah. try to remind myself of the first question. So the, the, first second, question, the second one is more pragmatic. So there, is, okay. there are papers now out there that the mouse V1 responds to, uh, to other things like locomotion speed and stuff like that. So are you, uh, how do you see that and uh, what's your opinion of this? Yeah, well in certain circles I used to refer to this as active vision, but, uh, but I don't really have any evidence that, um, that it is that. I think the mouse visual system is a great model of the peripheral visual system in human people. That is, not our fovea, not, you know, we use our peripheral retina and the peripheral representation of our visual system mainly to tell us where to move our eyes. And there's very little psychophysics telling us what can you do with the peripheral part of your visual system, you know, to, to see the world. The mice don't have a foveal visual system. They only have this peripheral visual system. And I think Ed Pugh has done beautiful experiments on the retina showing that really that's a, that the mouse retina is a good model of peripheral retina in monkeys and, and man. And I'm, I think the V1 representation may work similarly. But um, so the answer is, I, you know, we don't really know yet. And I think there are a lot of behavioral experiments that need to be done, and you know there are people who are doing them. So I think we'll have a lot more to say. Um, re regarding your inactivation experiments, if you uh, if you photolytically damage 12 to 45 random neurons uh, yeah. in a local circuit, um, might you also see something quite similar due to the um, sort of disruption of a local network? Perhaps, but you would expect if there were any nonspecific effects of this photolytic damage to disrupt the specificity of the neuronal responses to visual stimuli. And the neurons remain perfectly orientation selective. You know, the only, if, the, it had, if you had only looked at the neurons at the mice when they were standing still, you would think you had done no damage at all. It's just when they start to run, nothing happens. So we worried about it that. That's why we didn't blow the neurons away at the beginning. But um, we see no evidence the, of any nonspecific change in the neuronal responses, except the, you know, they, they, re, they retain all the sort of normal specificity that upper layer excitatory neurons in the mice have. 
So I, I, th I think the thrust of the question is probably wrong. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if you've considered any fundamental link to hippocampal theta, which is also correlated with running in mice and rats, or very strongly correlated, which is cholinergically driven, and this also has a high level of signal to noise in the hippocampus. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's true. Uh, is there any so, linkage between uh, the, the you know, state changes? Th th right now, we don't quite have the molecular tools to uh, dissect this system. I mean, you know, giving nicotinic blockers, you don't, you don't have a clue which cells they're blocking the nicotinic receptors on. I think a year from now that won't be true. We're going to be able to dissect the system a little more carefully. So, um, I, you know, so I, my, my intuition is that it's not only acetylcholine, that other neuromodulators are also involved in this process. But we don't really, I've shown you the evidence we have. So. All right, last question. Um, you may have touched upon this briefly here. But I'm wondering if uh, the effect on this cortical gain is short term or long term. So if you have a brief or transient locomotory period or a brief channel load absence stimulation, how long does the gain persist? The gain seems to be over within a second. I mean, it's, um, you know, we're using calcium imaging, and calcium imaging is kind of slow. Um, and I don't think we can say any more about it. We tried, we, we actually looked at the data and, you know, can we, can we be much more precise about this? Is it over within 10 milliseconds and stuff? And we just can't make a statement better than that. But the change in gain does not outlast locomotion by more than a second. So you need to be constantly locomoting in order to have an increased gain. Yeah. Thank you. Let's thank uh, Mike again. Thank you.